This is KGW News at 11. The Clark County Sheriff's Office continues to investigate after a police officer shot and killed a man near the Vancouver waterfront. Police say he pointed what appeared to be a gun at an officer. Thanks for joining us tonight at 11. I'm John Adams. Ashley Grahams joins us live at the scene where roads have been blocked off since this afternoon. Ashley, what are you seeing now? Well, those roads still closed here. Investigators going on nearly eight hours here just off the Vancouver waterfront. You can see that tape running right through the road. Police cruisers still here. Lights on. These investigators still working. Vancouver police were originally called down to the waterfront because of a report of an aggressive dog. When they arrived, police officers approached the owner, and that's what led to an officer firing their gun. About two blocks away from the Vancouver waterfront, police cars block the road. An investigation is underway where Columbia Street meets Columbia Way. It's beautiful down here and you don't normally see this sort of thing down here. Just before two in the afternoon, Vancouver police responded to a report of an aggressive German shepherd that bit someone. And officers were told the owner of the dog had a gun. When police found the man and the dog around three o'clock, they say the dog attempted to bite another person. The officers approached the man, and that's when they say he pointed what appeared to be a gun at an officer. One of the officers shot the man, killing him. The Clark County Sheriff's Office is investigating, and the two VPD officers involved are on leave, which is standard protocol. Now, they have yet to release the name of either of those officers or the man that was killed. Now, as for the dog, that dog was safely transported to the Humane Society, uh, and uh, Vancouver Police in Clark County will continue to update us uh, as we learn more. John. All right, Ashley, thank you. Well, new tonight, Portland police identify the motorcyclist killed in a crash that happened Wednesday. The bureau says 22 year old Philip Taylor of Happy Valley died after his motorcycle hit a car at Southeast Flavel in 112th. The driver was hospitalized but was able to give a statement to officers. No one has been arrested. The crash is still under investigation. Portland police are investigating a pair of burglary cases at a church in downtown Portland. PPB says a suspect broke into St. Michael, the Archangel Catholic Church on May 28th and 29th. He stole multiple items, including clothing, electronics, a bike, including at least one item considered sacred to the Catholic Church. We've reached out to PPB and the church for more information. really fun. I love how fresh it is right now and it's just overall a great experience. My whole life we came going to parades. It was a good year. We made it to all three parades and my grandpa would little, literally carry little wooden stools to the parade. I'm excited because it's a nice weather and I'm here with my mom and my dad and my sister. Whether they were first timers or longtime fans, hundreds of thousands came out to the largest parade of the Rose Festival, the Grand Floral Parade this morning at Memorial Coliseum. It featured marching bands, dancers and community groups with themes of unity, service and tradition. And of course, the parade also celebrated the Rose City and the community. Everything went off mostly without a hitch. Portland police say the event was briefly interrupted by protesters. Officers were aware of a protest happening at Northeast MLK and Pacific Avenue and warned them not to disrupt the event. The Bureau says some of the protesters crossed a quote honor line into the street, then became verbally hostile. They started making arrests after protesters pushed through officers to lie on the parade route with at least one person throwing beverages at officers. Eight people were booked on charges of second degree disorderly conduct. The person who threw that beverage was also booked on harassment and interfering with a peace officer. Well, turning out of the weather and the weather for the Grand Floral Parade cooperated this year. Sunny and dry conditions from beginning to end. Let's bring in meteorologist Joe Ranieri. What's the rest of the weekend looking like, Joe? More of the same. In fact, tomorrow is going to be looking and feeling a little nicer. Of course, we had a little bit of that kind of humid conditions uh, 
on and off throughout part of the day uh, during the parade. But again, it was a, a beautiful day for a parade and thanks in part to that ridge of high pressure that's going to be with us over the next couple of days. We have been picking up some thunderstorm activity throughout the east side of the state along the Oregon Idaho border and that's going to continue uh, throughout tomorrow morning a little bit into the afternoon as well. But we will be waking up to a brief morning clouds throughout the valley. Those clouds really take a little bit to melt away along the Oregon coast, but up and down the I-5 corridor, we're going to be seeing clear skies uh, by 9 o'clock in the morning, and those clear skies carry over into the early part of next week as well. We'll start to see some clouds increase a little bit by Tuesday morning, but our temperatures are going to be really perfect, picture perfect practically for this time of year. What was picture perfect was the sunset along the Oregon coast earlier today. You can kind of see some of those high clouds moved in along the Oregon beaches as well, but uh, that sunset just really popped. Here it is. Just got to wait for it for a little bit, and yeah, a lot of people enjoying the, uh, the northern part of the Oregon coast earlier today, and there is that sunset. Uh, we are slowly seeing longer days. That is absolutely stunning to see out there. I could watch that all night, but yeah, temperatures tomorrow will be a little bit on the cooler side along the beaches, but it will take a little bit to see those blue skies pop, but I'll talk more about what you can expect to see over the next few days in just a few minutes. All right, Joe, we'll see you later in the show. Thank you. In West Central Oregon, rallies continue calling for an end to the ongoing conflict in Gaza. Members of Corvallis Palestine Solidarity have been gathering downtown for months on end. We're protesting the genocide that's happening to the Palestinian people by the Israeli government. Um, we've been here for a very long time, since October. This demonstrator says the weekly rallies are made up of people like him who have family or other connections to Gaza. He says they feel a strong need to make their voices heard, and they accomplish that by showing up every weekend. I just graduated from OSU last year. I'm a student, and there's no more universities left in Gaza. They've all been destroyed. <laughs> that, to me, is really, really hard to come to terms with, and it's really hard to humanize people so far away. The group says new people are joining every week and they're seeing a steady amount of donations for people affected by the war. Their plan is to split the money between the Palestinian Relief Fund and Portland families that are looking to evacuate loved ones from Gaza. New tonight, first responders say a person is alive because they were wearing their life jacket on Vancouver Lake. Just before 4.30 this afternoon, firefighters were called to the lake after a boater called 911 saying his kayak was sinking. The department says given the time it took to respond, the man would not have survived without the life jacket he was wearing. A similar situation this afternoon in the Washougal River could have ended worse. Multiple crews in the Clark Cowlitz County responded around 2.30 to help a rescue team get a person out of the water. River conditions made it difficult for crews to reach him. They were able to bring him back to shore, but first responders want to remind people to have the right kind of life jacket on for the water you're in. A block party celebrating LGBT pride in downtown Vancouver continues to grow. Earlier today, Dandelion Tea House partnered with local nonprofit Queer Youth Resource Center to hold the third annual Pride Block Party. The free event featured family friendly activities, live performances, and community resource groups. One of the organizers tells us the event has doubled in size every year. The reason we do it is because of the feeling that we have here right now in the midst of it, surrounded by our friends in an inclusive and safe environment. Uh, it's, it's really for the children so that they don't have to deal with the same shame and stigma that the queer community has faced in the past and they feel empowered to embrace their identity. She adds, given this year's turnout, they're planning an even larger events in the future.